press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update. A sale and leaseback transaction is normally preferred by those entities which are facing some financial crisis. See, as an entity, you may be having a cash crunch, but at the same time, you're owning a valuable property. But I'm not able to sell that valuable property because I have to use that property in my business. That is when I can structure a sale and lease back transaction. First of all, I will sell that property for cash. So I will get the much needed cash. And at the same time, the buyer will lease the asset back to me. Because the asset is leased back to me, I am in a position to use that particular asset. So it serves both the purposes for me. I get the much needed cash and at the same time, I'm also able to use that particular property. A sale and lease back transaction is a transaction where a seller will later on become a lessee and the buyer will later on become a lesser. If we just put it on the board, it will become very clear. So you're having two parties, let's say party A and another party to the contract is B. First of all, A sells the asset. So right now, A is the seller. B is the buyer. Later, the buyer leases the asset back. So now B has become the lesser and A has become the lesser. So that's the reason we were saying that a sale and lease back is a typical transaction where the buyer will later on become the lesser and the seller will later on become the lesser. Now, what should be the treatment of sale and lease back transaction? The treatment will depend upon what is the nature of the lease arrangement that you are entering into. We know that the lease that will be entered into will be either a finance lease or it shall be an operating lease. So let's examine both the cases. Let's consider the first case where the sale is later resulting into a finance lease. Right, we are saying that the sale later results into finance lease. So let's examine this situation right now. Okay, what is the first thing that we are doing? The first thing is that A is selling the asset. If you are selling the asset to B, what exactly is happening in this transaction? When A sells to B, you are transferring the property and goods in favor of the buyer. So when A is selling to B, we say that A transfers property in goods, right? This is what will happen. And then you are entering into a finance lease. Tell me, what is a finance lease under accounting standard 19? A finance lease is a lease where the lesser transfers substantial risk and rewards incident to ownership to the lessee. So once you enter into a finance lease, what is the lesser doing? The lesser transfers substantial risk and rewards of ownership. So just see how typical this situation actually is. First, A will sell to B. When A is selling to B, A is making B the legal owner of the asset. So property and goods have got transferred. So now the legal ownership of the asset is not with A. The legal ownership of the asset is with B. Now ask yourself, if B is the legal owner, don't you feel that the benefits of ownership should be enjoyed by B? First, I sell the asset to you. Let's say there is some property. I sell the property to you. The moment I sell the property to you, you become the legal owner of the property. If you are the legal owner of the property, then you should be enjoying the benefits of the ownership. You should be taking the risk of ownership. But instead of that, you enter into a finance lease arrangement with me. 
and once you enter into a finance lease arrangement with me you are transferring away the benefits of the ownership back to me that is the reason as19 argues that this is not at all a sale transaction what kind of sale is it a is selling the asset and still a is enjoying the benefits of ownership how is that possible and that is the reason accounting standard rightly says that this is not a sale transaction remember if it is not a sale transaction then at the time of sale whatever profit a is booking or whatever loss a is booking this profit this loss cannot be immediately transferred to the pnl the profit or the loss will be deferred and recognized over a period of time again i am repeating in case if you have missed out a is selling the property to b and then is getting all the benefits of ownership back so i am selling the property but still i remain as good as the owner so i will not consider this as a sale transaction if this is not a sale transaction whatever profit i am booking or whatever loss i am booking at the time of sale i shall defer that profit i shall not transfer it immediately to the pnl but yes whatever is the useful life of the asset over the useful life of the asset in the ratio of depreciation i will defer and amortize that profit or the loss so this is what will happen in case if you are entering into a sale which later is resulting into a finance lease what if you are selling it and it results into operating lease how will things be different now if it is an operating lease okay the first transaction is the sale transaction when i do the sale transaction i make the buyer the legal owner of the asset and then the buyer is entering into an operating lease when you enter into operating lease you are not transferring substantial risk and rewards of ownership so earlier we were saying transfer but now there is no transfer of substantial risk and rewards of ownership in other words b will now become the legal owner and b will now enjoy the benefits of ownership a will be now as a seller a will be deprived of the benefits of ownership and as this should be treated as a sale transaction if it is a sale transaction i have every right to book the profit i have every right to book the loss however there are certain checks and balances over here when the profit or loss is to be booked but one thing is very clear one thing is very clear i have to treat this as a sale transaction and if you say it is a sale there is every question of recognizing a profit i have every right of recognizing by chance if there is a loss but yes certain checks and balances are given in the accounting standard we have to go through those checks and balances so how exactly will i recognize the profit or the loss let's bring this to now a logical conclusion so we say sale later results into let's try to summarize the entire thing sale later results into finance lease we are saying this is not this is not a sale transaction okay so i will calculate sales value minus carrying amount of course there will be some profit loss but it will not go immediately to the pnl so i will say here profit oblique loss is deferred and amortized right i'll say profit or loss is deferred and amortized over the lease term in ratio of 
depreciation. Right, so we will do it in the ratio of the depreciation. Depreciation, of course, of the leased asset. So whatever asset you have leased, what is this leased term? And over that particular term, I will recognize whatever is uh, the profit or the loss. What if the sale later results into operating lease? Remember, this is a sale transaction. So if it's resulting into an operating lease, it's a sale transaction. If it is a sale transaction, I would like to recognize the selling profit or loss. How shall that be done? We have to compare the sales value with the fair value of the asset. So the first possibility is that the sales value is equal to the fair value or the sales value is lower than the fair value. In this situation, we should calculate sales value minus the carrying amount. This is the profit that has to be immediately recognized. This is the loss that should be immediately recognized. However, in terms of loss, AS19 offers one more possibility. It is quite possible that today I might be selling the asset at a loss, but you as a lesser will charge lease rent at a lower amount. You know, as a seller, I argue with you that, see, I'm selling this asset at a loss. So what you tell me is that don't worry. In the future, when you have to pay lease rent, you pay me lease rent at a rate which is less than the market rate. In other words, I will be compensated for the loss that I am incurring. In such a situation, loss should be deferred. However, if no such thing is there, then the profit as well as the loss, both of them will be immediately recognized by us. So when we say sales value minus the carrying amount, we say here, profit oblique loss is immediately recognized. Full stop. However, loss is deferred and amortized if future lease rentals are below market rates. So when this kind of a property is leased back, the normal lease rent, the market lease rent is let's say 30,000 rupees, but the lesser gives me only for 25,000 rupees. Why? Because earlier I had suffered a loss. So if the loss is going to get compensated by future lease rentals, then the loss should be deferred and amortized. Otherwise, we should be recognizing the loss or recognizing the profit immediately to our p and but this is what I will do when the sales value is equal to fair value or lower than the fair value. What if the sales value is higher than the fair value? Then what to do? So sales value is turning out to be higher than the fair value. In this particular situation, we will break it down into two. The first possibility is fair value will be compared with the carrying amount. So fair value minus carrying amount. The difference between the fair value and the carrying amount will be immediately recognized in the PNL. Okay. So this profit oblique loss is immediately recognized in profit and loss account. And finally, what about the excess of the sales value over fair value? This profit or this loss will be deferred and amortized. So sales value minus fair value, we will say profit oblique loss is deferred and amortized. I will say profit or loss is deferred, amortized over the period the asset is expected to be used. 
Let's try to understand this situation. This is fine, you know, this we can understand that this profit or loss will immediately go to the PL. But when the sales value is higher than the fair value, why are we having this typical situation? Now see, sales value is greater than fair value. This itself shows that this is not an arm's length transaction. How can the sales value be more than the fair value? For example, let us say I have a property. I carry out its valuation. Value of that property, let's say, is turning out to be 10 lakhs of rupees. Something which is worth 10 lakhs, I am selling it for 12 lakhs. Right? I am fitting into this situation. Sales value is greater than fair value. If something is worth 10 lakhs, why is anyone paying you 2 lakhs extra? Why is someone ready to pay you 12? This clearly means that this is not an arm's length transaction. For example, I might be selling this property to my subsidiary, a company which is absolutely within my control. And hence something worth 10 lakhs, I am selling it for 12 lakhs. So what AS19 says is that see, sales value minus fair value, that is 12 lakhs minus 10 lakhs, this 2 lakhs of profit is artificially built up profit. This artificially built up profit should not go immediately to the p &L. It will go to the p &L, but over the period the asset is expected to be used. So I will consider this as genuine profit which will go straight to the p and Well, this will be the artificially built up profit which I will recognize in my p and over a period of time. So indeed it is a sale transaction, but if the sales value is greater than fair value, then we argue it is not an arm's length transaction and accordingly provide the trade. Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update.